Um, <coughs> I'm John Gibb Milspa, and I'm going to try to plug in my computer while speaking. Okay, here we go. I, uh, for 12 years, was a congregational minister within Unitarian Universalism, where Lisa went and found it was not as receptive as she would have hoped, um, all the while doing advocacy on animal rights and vegan issues. And I've learned a lot in that process in my own congregations that I've served, and I've also learned a lot from organizing 400 uh, Unitarian Universalist congregations to persuade the denomination to adopt a what, what, what was called a statement of conscience. Um, so basically 400 co congregations studied issues related to values and eating and came up with a statement that looks like it's written by 400 congregations, um, but it does name a number of the ways that our values are connected to the food that we eat. And rather than just being a piece of paper, what was valuable about the process was leading all these folks through those discussions and bringing activists from a place of feeling like they're on the margins to um, being able to say, actually, our denomination as a whole has passed this statement that says that these things really matter. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what I'm calling just good food. And for those of you who um, have, who are on Twitter, the hashtag that's being used for this conference that I've seen the most is AR2015, and I'm John Gibb Millspa, um, if you want to get in touch by Twitter later. I'm also going to pass around um, some clipboards because I'm going to be going over a lot of resources that I developed that are for faith communities, and if any of you would like me to email you PDFs of those, um, I would be more than happy to. And I'll ask for someone to assemble these because I didn't quite do that. <laughs> okay, so my presentation um, goes over seven points that I have found helpful in organizing faith communities both locally and nationally. And I, I can also send you a PDF of this presentation if you sign the sheet. Um, I did change the sequence slightly. You saw me at the table, so you'll notice that the numbering doesn't quite add up at one point. Um, but I think that these are broadly applicable, and they're not necessarily linear. You don't have to start with one and make sure that you do two and three before you get to five, so it'll, it'll make sense to you in your own uh, context what makes sense. But how many of you have tried to advocate in a faith community for these concerns to be taken more seriously? Okay, that's great. That's great. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of experience in the room. And how many people have found that the leadership, whether it's a clergy person or a, a lay leader um, or a board, has just said, this is great, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. <laughs> Some of you, okay, but nowhere near the majority. So one of the first things I recommend in organizing, sorry? Oh, thank you, but no, oh, okay, that's an important distinction. They thanked her, but then did not. So one of the first um, recommendations I would have would be to support leadership. And by leadership, I don't necessarily mean those in authority. I have um, on the left a person who is who's moved on from her position, or I guess it's your, yeah, your left. A person who's moved on from her position as a congregational leader to now being a seminary president of one of our seminaries. Um, and over here is a, a guy named Tim DeChristopher. Um, and they are both important leaders, I would say, in our movement, very different sorts of leaders. One has a lot of institutional authority. Um, she provides services that the community values, and in exchange, she gets power. Whereas he um, is on the outskirts and the margins of the community, he's, he's not in an official role, but both of them can provide leadership. The leadership they provide looks very different, but the way I understand leadership is mobilizing the resources of a group to make positive progress. So one of the first things you can do is look to who the leaders in the congregation already are. Um, who's having influence that's making things better in the congregation. And given where they are in their position of leadership, 
Um, if they have, if they have authority, if they're the minister, they have certain blessings, I would say, that come with that. Like, they're powerful. When people think of the congregation, they, they think of her. Um, she, when she speaks, people listen to her. Um, what are some of the other great parts when we fantasize about what it would be like to be a religious leader? You can mobilize people pretty easily. Yeah. They'll listen to you. Yeah, you'll be listened to. And if someone says, you know, oh, would you mind uh, assembling these clipboards, which you may have no interest in? Well, I'm up here, I'm the guy at the podium, right? Where as if someone else, if someone else just from the crowd was like, hey, would you mind assembling these clipboards for me? You might not uh, defer to the authority in the same way. But there are also curses from leading from a place of authority in that you have to be responsive to so many different constituencies and there's so many different parts of your job um, but then when someone comes to you with a great idea or something you don't necessarily understand or that's not central to your role as you understand it um, authority figures often speak about how constrained they are and how little freedom they have to actually do much of anything because they feel like they're being constantly observed, they're living in a glass house, and they have to not be upsetting uh, people, other people with power, or the big givers, or whoever it might be. Um, we're familiar with the curses of leading without authority when you're trying to speak up and, and make change, but you're not in a position of authority to do that. But there are also blessings. You have a lot more freedom to do whatever you want, right? Those who are at the... Um, outskirts of a community in some ways are, are less free than those with authority because um, they're not being listened to, they're not necessarily speaking the language that the community understands, um, they're not culturally central, but there's also some freedoms there that are not available to the person who's in the place of authority as easily. So think about your own role in the congregation that you're trying to influence, uh, whether you're part of it or not, and think about other leaders' roles, and I encourage you to think about, well, how can I support all leaders, especially those with authority, initially? You know, rather than going in and say, why don't you do this? Say, what can I do to help around here? You know, what do you need? And, and build a relationship over time. One thing we did on a national level to support leaders um, with authority was we put together a worship resources supplement which had, uh, in our Unitarian Universalist tradition, uh, gathered together all the hymns in the hymnal, all the readings, uh, some things that weren't in the hymnal, and just said, look, if you want to do a service on this topic, we've done all the pre-work for you, and we've also had um, something like 20 people submit, I, I realize you can't read this, but um, portions of sermons that they've said, you're free to use this if you want it, um, you don't have to really credit me, and so for a minister in our tradition, writing a sermon every single week and a, creating a service every single week is a lot of effort, and we suddenly gave them an extremely low-effort way to participate. So if you want to address this topic in church, it's going to be easier for you than your typical service. Um, so, so the renumbering actually began with supporting leaders. But also think about what are the drivers in your congregation that you're trying to influence. And, and by that I mean what's motivating people. So the symbol of Unitarian Universalism is up there in the upper right. And if you, if you read up on Unitarian Universalism, you'd say, okay, Unitarian Universalists are about uh, supporting freedom of religious expression and freedom of religious belief and honoring the inherent dignity and worth of every person and the interdependent web of which we're all a part. And that's true, but is that why everyone's coming to church every Sunday morning, in our case? Kind of, but they're also showing up because they're in some level of spiritual pain, or because they have friends who are there, or they like food, or it's you know, near their house. So actually get to know, what, why do these people keep coming back? And often it really is about community in my experience. People come for a whole bunch of reasons and they stay because of community. So what are, what are ways in which you can approach this work in a way that fits with the uh, reasons that people are already there? And what are the social issues that they already care about? So I was um, 
I was thinking about this group and how we're from all over. In the U.S., um, the food system is the number one employer of any industry, and many of our religious people eat uh, in one way or another. They go out to restaurants, they go grocery shopping, and so on. And many of us talk, many religious traditions talk about um, laborers being treated well and making a living wage and so on. So that's just an immediate way to get people in the door, in a door that will eventually lead them to openness to considering veganism and animal rights, as, as I hope you'll see. Uh, I was recently in the South and uh, presenting to a region that had this as the logo, so I just superimpose that over a map of the United States and participation in SNAP, which is our food stamps program. And I asked them to look at um, the country as a whole, and the darker colors um, mean more participation in SNAP. And I asked them to imagine what they thought it might be in their area. And it was significantly darker than the rest of the country. You know, and so maybe congregations in their region tend to be in areas where more people are relying on government support in order to eat and are malnourished and are hungry and are living with food insecurity. So think about not only the congregation but the surrounding uh, community and what people are already involved in and motivated to do. And then once you have uh, that in hand, you can find allies to begin working with you. Um, in my case, I was charged to design this national um, four-year program, and I started on that, and I was like, yeah, I'm a smart guy, I can do this. And then I thought, well, that's ridiculous. I am a guy, you know. Um, I have a certain perspective, which happens to be informed by my location, which is straight, white, male, middle class, um, I've lived where I've lived, I've experienced what I've experienced. For me to design for our entire denomination a sort of primer on what food justice is and how to get involved would be the height of, insert uh, derogatory word here. <laughs> so, you know, great guy. But I started reaching out to other groups within Unitarian Universalism, and I thought, who in Unitarian Universalism would care about this? Well, we have a United Nations office. Their perspective is going to be so different than mine. We have a ministry for Earth. We have the young religious Unitarian Universalists, uh, teenagers. We have those for economic justice. We have diverse and revolutionary Unitarian Universalist multicultural ministry. Uh, we have allies for racial equity, who are white allies of John. We have the Unitarian Universalist Animal Ministry, which has done an incredible amount of good, but it has also been somewhat marginalized. So I reached out to all of these groups and I said, I want to do this in a way that respects your perspective on um, food justice. And got, it, our first few meetings were a lot of infighting about people saying, well, my issue matters more than yours, it really should be about this. And once we got through all of that, um, people began to take others' issues seriously and see how they related to their own. Um, and we did a lot of conference calls. <laughs> so design doorways, um, building on what you know of the community and what it's interested in. So I mentioned earlier potlucks. You know, people like movies. People care about certain justice issues in the um, community already. There are certain doors here that I would like to go through, and other ones I I wouldn't. I'm not particularly impressed with. And if if we were to name the aspects of even animal rights that were of greatest interest to the people in this room, there would be some that I'd be like, oh, I want to go find out about what that person's doing. And others where, even though I care about your issue, I'm just like, eh, probably not going to devote my life energy to that because I'm more drawn to this other thing. So designing a variety of doorways and ways in to get people talking about the issues. So this is another resource I'll send out. Um, was the resource guide that we put together, and it was built like a menu. So we said, okay, you can organize a task force, you can have a potluck and a movie, you can have a panel discussion where you have someone from your congregation and someone from outside come talk about these issues, or just read an article and get a group together to talk about them. Um, you can start a compost pile at church, you can work with your finance committee of all things, and 
You may be wondering, but wait, how is this veganism? How is this animal rights? And, and you'll find out. Um, so, so we provided far more than any one congregation could do um, in terms of ideas. And that drew in so many folks because people could find something that was of interest to them and that they could get other people involved in. And we made, I made sure to include images that people would relate to, you know, for this beginning of the process, how, how difficult it is to know what's right and wrong. So as you, I was going to give you a moment to think about uh, your own community, and here's the numbering being off, but I, I'm not going to for lack of time, but I, I do encourage you with all seven of these, of which we've done four, not three, starting with um, supporting your leadership, actually think through, well, what does drive the community that I'm trying to influence? Who might be my allies? Um, how could I support leadership for a while and then ask how I can be of support on this issue? Which doorways might draw people in? Uh, the last few are honoring the wisdom that is already in the congregation. So in Unitarian Universalism, we look to uh, a number of world's religious traditions and scriptures, as well as science and the guidance of reason. Uh, the guidance of reason. So what can we look to in terms of what people are already agreed on and say, um, as you know, this as Lisa did, you know, compassion is at the heart of all world religions, or science is now telling us that animals' experiences are rich and varied and, and they actually do suffer. Um, it, I have found it effective in my own congregation to point to figures from the past who have been involved in animal rights, and I won't go over all these people's names, but um, you may discover, if you're working with Protestant or Catholic churches, that there's a history of founding local humane societies. I, I don't know if it's the majority of the humane societies in this country, but a whole lot of them were founded by churches. Um, here's the founder of the ASPCA, Henry Berg. Um, Schweitzer, I would love to tell you more, but honor, honor the pre-existing wisdom and let people know it's already there as part of our tradition. I'm just carrying on this thread that's been part of our tradition for quite a while. And at the same time, cultivate humility in yourself and in others. <clears throat> humility is not the um, is not righteousness as as used in the negative sense, where you know that what you believe is what everyone else should believe, and the way that you act is how everyone else should act. You know, righteousness. I I started off my vegan life as that righteous uh, vegan, religious vegan, angry. Um, and more, and, and that guy's still hearing me. But uh, on the other end of the spectrum, from righteousness, I would say is apathy or willful ignorance, where you know that these issues are real, you know that they matter, but you just don't really allow them to get any sort of hook in you. And I think that's where a lot of our religious people are. They know enough about this to know that they should engage or want to, but it's hard, so they don't. A little boy asked his mother what the difference was between ignorance and apathy, and she said, um, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> but the middle way, I would say, is, <laughs> is humility, where you know that your own life experience and studies and so on matter, and <laughs> you also know that um, what other people believe and what they're bringing to the conversation matters. And a genuine spiritual humility where you're learning from each other and talking is what I see changing communities more than one person coming and opposing their viewpoint. Um, so finally, you can create champions. We did a viral, an intentionally viral campaign where we said for the 40th anniversary of Earth Day, um, make a 40-day commitment to food justice in your own personal life in some way, whatever you want to do, if it's not using a plastic water bottle, if it's uh, going vegan for 40 days, whatever it might be, and then find 39 other people in your church to do it with you, so it's 40, 40, 40, and we'll send you a certificate of accomplishment, and you can't believe how many people were crazy for that certificate of accomplishment. And they went about it in such different ways. Um, 
But my, my sense is that once you get people through a doorway um, where they begin to connect their values to food and a little bit make a little bit of progress into that house, um, it is almost inescapable how much vegetarianism and veganism and animals are central to the concerns that they walked in with, or at least d deeply interrelated. Um, so I, I, I found that by taking a food justice approach, we ended up with um, shifting veganism and vegetarianism even from the margins to being an accepted part of just what it is to be Unitarian Universalist. Not that everyone is, but that some of us are, and that's a legitimate way of uh, expressing your faith. So blessings on your leadership, and if you didn't get to the sign-up sheet, I'm happy to uh, be in touch to support you in your work. Thank you.